Production funding for Ruckus has been provided by gifts from Dave and Jamie Cummings, the Hartwig family, Barbara and Peter Gattermeyer, the Courtney S. Turner Charitable Trust, John H. Mize and Bank of America N.A. co-trustees, and by viewers like you. Thank you. Welcome to Ruckus, our weekly food for thought fight over the news of the day and the trends of the times. I'm Mike Shannon. The Ruckheads join me shortly in our topics this week. Elections have consequences. Electing women have positive consequences, says the star, and the results of a consequential tax increase, plus roast and toast. But we start with our newsmaker segment and talk about law enforcement in Jackson County with someone who knows a lot about it. He's Darrell Forte, who was appointed Jackson County Sheriff by County Executive Frank White following the resignation of Mike Sharp. Forte retired last year from the Kansas City, Missouri Police Department after 31 years on the force, serving as chief from 2011 until March of 2017. We are pleased indeed to welcome Daryl Forte to Ruckus. Thank you for joining us, sir. Thank you. Is it strange to be called sheriff and not chief after all the years that you served as police chief? Uh, not really. I'm still called chief in, in many circles around the community. I'm known as the chief, so I just changed my Twitter account yesterday to at Sheriff Forte. Uh, a relatively short time ago, last year, you retired. Now you're back as the interim sheriff and you're running in the fall election to be sheriff, an elected sheriff in Jackson County. Why in the world do you want to do this all? You know, simple answer, because I care. Uh, when the, when the, the opening was first presented to me, I had no interest in it. And about a week later, after I talked to numerous people around the, uh, the county, I decided to put my, put my name in the hat, and uh, I'm excited about the opportunities ahead of me. Plans are underway, and if voters approve, the jail, the Jackson County uh, Jail, will be under the jurisdiction of the sheriff. That would seem to bring with it lots of problems. Do you want to tackle that? Uh, absolutely. There, there, there's problems, but there's also opportunities. I uh, visited Boone County yesterday for a four-hour meeting with the uh, Jail Standards and Training Committee, and they're, uh, com uh, com uh, I guess, sheriffs, uh, administrators of jails and sheriffs were in the meetings, about 30 or 40 of us in that meeting, and we talked about some of the issues with jails, so I'm trying to familiarize myself with the operations of a jail, so we'll be prepared. Well, you've been through the Jackson County Jail, I'm sure, and yes. uh, there are many problems there. What, in your estimation, are two or three of the, the most major problems? I think overcrowding is a, a problem and understaffing a, a problem. Anytime you have understaffing, you can't move the uh, detainees about uh, like you probably want to. They have to get exercise and they have to have some free time. And if they don't, they'll create their own opportunity to do some things. I'm scheduled to visit the jail again tomorrow. Uh, is it your view a new jail should be built or do you think the current jail should be refurbished? A new jail should be built. It should be on one level. If you look around the country at the different detention facilities, most of them are on one level. So, I, 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 and, and, and at a better location. You need, you need social services and you need a place to provide those so, social services. You need a recreation area and, and we don't have those things now at the current Is jail. there any talk about a regional jail of some sort? Yeah, there's always been talk about it, but uh, there's so many smaller agencies around uh, Missouri that already have newer facilities, they're probably not going to be interested. Like when I talked to the ones yesterday, uh, some of them already have plans to, to build a new detention facility or jail wherever they're located. So they're not really looking out to, to do anything yeah. regionally in this area. I think the estimates to build a new jail come in at about $150 million. Where would that money come from? But don't know. That'd be up to the legislators to decide where that'd come from. Do you think a tax increase might be the answer? You know what? I, it, it'd be premature for me to say right now because I'm just learning about the, the yeah. different. I've been in the job for eight, nine weeks now, and I'm just learning about the what's going on, going on at the actual sheriff's office. So I don't know a lot about how that will be funded. I just know we need another facility and we need more. And it will more cost people. a lot of money. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, frequent news stories suggest dysfunction in Jackson County government. The county executive fights with the county legislature. The county legislature fights with the county legislature. County prosecutor fights with the county executive. Does all this dysfunction make it difficult for you to serve as sheriff? No, you know, I'm excited about it because when you, when you really delve down into the different issues, some of it's personality, uh, some of it's media is being used to portray some things that are, that are not accurate on some people. 
So uh, again, I, I haven't gotten into that part. I'm new in politics. It's a whole different world for me in county politics. I focus on what's been happening at the sheriff's office, and we have a lot of internal issues. We have people on payroll that had nobody seen for years. We've had uh, we had don't have policies that we need to have. They don't have a one officer car uh, procedure policy. There's no policy to talk about uh, to uh, uh, talk one one officer car procedure evidence recovery. Uh, it, I can go into a lot of things. I can't talk about a lot of them publicly now, but there's so many dysfunctional things where I'm sitting now at the sheriff's office, I, I don't have enough time to focus on other county issues. All right, you're running for sheriff in the August primary as a Democrat. We yes. assume you'll get through the primary and be in the fall general election. Yes. Thank you very much for coming in. Good luck to you. It's a pleasure to meet you. Thank you, sir. And that was Jackson County Sheriff Darrell Forte. Now let's meet the panel and start a ruckus. Patrick McInerney is a former prosecutor, now in private practice with Spencer Fain. Gwen Grant is president and CEO of the Urban League in Kansas City. Annie Presley is an author, publisher, and GOP fundraiser. And baritone barrister Steve Marakian is with the firm of Warsh, Hobbs, and Marakian. Welcome to all of you. We won't ask you to sing on this appearance. A blessing to everyone, I assure you. All right. After an income tax hike for Kansans and a burgeoning national economy, the state has ended its fiscal year with a surplus of $318 million. So what should happen to that money? Should it be returned to the taxpayers in the form of a tax cut? Should it go into a general fund to enhance various state programs? Or should it all be given to the schools, as much of the budget already is? This question will likely divide GOP candidates running in the August primary, and may cause debate among Democratic hopefuls as well. $318 million. How do you think the money should be spent? We'll ask the only Kansan on the panel, Steve Morakian. Well, I think that, uh, that if I had to prioritize three things, I would say uh, infrastructure. Kansas, like most of the country, has problems with bridges and roads and streets, and they can, they can certainly use uh, that money for infrastructure. Secondly, I think with what I believe is an upturn in the economy, I think job training is critically important, and I think more money should be spent on job training to attract good, qualified workers to uh, a lot of different kinds of industries that are, seem to be burgeoning now. And third, I think there should be some additional money put into the Medicaid program. I think there are some folks um, in Kansas who are at the bottom end of the spectrum, who most of us don't even know the rules, but it's, it's absolutely astounding, quite frankly, that the Congress has muddied this up so much that, that people making between zero and $12,000 don't qualify. If you're over $12,000, you can get a subsidy. I mean, there's, there's crazy stuff out there that prevent the poorest of the poor from getting any medical care at all, and that should be fixed. Well, what about cutting taxes for taxpayers who spent this $318 million to get it into a surplus in Kansas? They're already talking about it again. So finally gotten back into a good state. I think there's so much pressure from so many different kinds of groups who want money that there's, there has to be some conversation about cutting taxes, but it's highly unlikely that it will occur. What do you think, Gwen? Do you see any chance that uh, taxes might be cut in Kansas or should they take this $318 million and hold on to it in case there are shortages as there may likely be? Well, you know, I'm in this really strange place where I'm agreeing with Steve. Yeah. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> it's like, wow, I was That's really surprised. Uh, How do you and I that? agree with Steve. I think <laughs> investing more in Medicaid uh, training programs makes really good sense. And, if, and I also think that some of the money should uh, go back to public education and they still have to deal with the funding issue and so this is an opportunity to address that. So the interesting thing is going to be to see what <laughs> position Collier stakes out because what Kobach has done is pretty much give Collier an early Christmas gift and said give it all back to everybody the Brownback approach which was a disaster and everybody agrees that that was a disaster so it's going to be interesting to see how Collier positions himself and his decisions now uh, with this 318 million dollars. When I wrote the introduction to this story a few days ago I said something about uh, or give it to the schools where much of it goes already kind of being facetious and just yesterday I heard a report that a high-ranking official with the Kansas Department of Education said apparently with some knowledge the court is going to ask for 369 million more dollars to go to schools in Kansas added to what's already been promised we're up to about 900 million dollars more 
than what has already been offered to the schools. Yeah, I think I think I, we've talked about this before. I sound like a broken record. I think the court is way out of line. I think their 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 position is absolutely entirely absurd. Quite frankly, I am I have come to the position where I would support, and if asked to vote for it, I would support an amendment, amendment to the Constitution because this court, in my view, is out of control on this issue. The funding is something that it clearly needs to be there, but for the Supreme Court to decide how many dollars have to be spent, and after they've come up with the amount they've come up with and the compromise position, for the court to now say, and they haven't said it yet, but, but if the court were to say, we're going to dictate that you have to put another $300 million into this thing, in my view, that is absolutely an overreach by the court, and if, the, if, the, if it takes an amendment to stop them from doing that, I'd be for it. Well, Patrick, don't most governments have something called a rainy day fund or something of that sort? Sure. Where they take <clears throat> excess income and hold it for a while and, and may have to use it for a variety of programs. Right, but that's a luxury for governments that have sufficient funding for the basic needs, like education, like Medicare, like like infrastructure. Um, so it, it is, and I say luxury, it's, it becomes an, a necessary luxury when uh, there's a rainy day that comes. But um, way above way above a rainy day fund on the menu needs to be things like Medicaid expansion, things like schools, things like infrastructure. Uh, do people like uh, Governor Collier and others who supported an increase in income taxes for schools benefit from what's happened? They'll benefit from the conversation because they'll get so much feedback. And that's probably the most important component for any candidate right now is just try to be listening. I would point out Collier didn't vote for anything. He was lieutenant governor, but since uh, he has become governor, he's spoken in behalf of increasing the amount of money that goes to schools and did not quarrel about the tax increase. A lot of legislators elected in November of 2016 are the ones who increase the income taxes. So can I ask, Annie, who does this cut toward? Does it cut toward Collier or Kobach? Well, it's hard to say, but Well, it Kobach should be positive for Collier, I would think, if you think that's great to have $318 million extra dollars. Well, they just need to be listening to find out what people really are thinking. Kobach has, you know, a very strong group of people who are with him and for him. Collier is building that now, so yeah. there are opportunities. A anyway, uh, Kobach is scheduled to be our guest next week on Ruckus, the first uh, part of the program, the first five-minute interview. We've invited Governor Collier on several occasions he has yet to accept. Kansas City Star opines that the so-called Year of the Woman in 1992 when voters sent more women to Congress than ever before, has not been the change maker some hoped. The Star notes that now only 23 of the 100 U.S. Senators are female, and only 84 of the 435 House members are women. Kansas has produced two women governors, no female Missouri governor yet, although Claire McCaskill came close. Women make up 26% of the Kansas legislature, only 23% of Missouri's. In essence, the Star editorial argues that women view elected office differently. They run to get things done, are more willing to compromise, and work in a collaborative manner. The Star wants more women in public office. Will they get their way this November? And we start with Annie. Well, it appears, based on what's going on at the federal level, that certainly that is going to happen. Right now, there's a 100% increase in candidates for the Senate and over a hundred percent increase in candidates for the House. So we've gone from 235 people who ran on both sides of the House and Senate last year and we're well over, we're nearing 500 candidates this year. So there are races going on all over the place. Ten toward Democrat candidates. Um, and that is probably a result of all that um, crazy protesting with the hats um, for um, to out, uh, outlash for Trump. All right, so a lot more women are running this year, but most of them are going to be Democrats. Yes, right? they, right. yeah, about double. All right, same question to Gwen. Do you think the star will get their way this November and more women will be elected to public well, office? Well, I, I certainly hope so. I think uh, Annie is right on in, in looking at the numbers and seeing that is certainly weighted on the Democratic side of the aisle as well. But I think the important thing here to look at, in addition to having more women running, is to not lose sight of the power of the as, of women uh, uh, in the uh, midterm elections. Uh, we have the power to elect more women, but we also have the power to elect more people who are 
in alignment with our views and what we want to see. And what you're seeing is that women are showing up at the polls and uh, have the opportunity to shape the midterm, the outcome of the midterm election. Patrick Hillary Clinton says, among a dozen or so other reasons, that one reason she lost the presidential campaign is because of misogyny. If that's true, will that be a burden for women running this fall? You know, I don't know why we continue to use this tired year of the woman moniker um, because <clears throat> it makes it sound like it's a once every quarter century deal, right? Because you right. talked about 1992. I was quoting the Kansas City Star. Yeah, I just think that's stupid because uh, if we're not to a place where every year is the year of the woman, then we're going in the wrong direction. And, and it's, it's really not a matter of how many women get elected. Like Gwen said, it's a matter of recognizing that, that women, A, are, are an enormous electoral force, but they don't vote as a monolith. Right? Yeah. You've got Republican women and independent women and Democratic women and libertarian women. So, it, you know, it, we, 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 we ought to and we have to, I think, focus on um, opportunities on the ground level for women and making those accessible and then let women chart their course and let, let women chart the course of, of this country before we start talking about these, these random years of the woman. Well, Steve, is the assumption that women are more willing to compromise mm -hmm. and collaborate than men. Is that true? Is that based on evidence or is that just opinion? Well, I haven't, I'm not a sociologist. I don't know. There's somebody out there I'm sure who can take statistics. No, you're a it, baritone. It's not, yes, I'm a baritone. You're a singer. <laughs> it's, not, it's not something that, that is intuitive to me. Okay, I, I have not seen that either in my, in my legal career, in working with women, many, many excellent women lawyers. Uh, they're they're no, more, no more willing to compromise or to give in on things than, than the men lawyers I work with as women judges, uh, in terms of what I see in Congress, particularly in the past decade, uh, we see some women who are, are every bit as stubborn, apparently, as, as, as the men. Uh, I certainly wouldn't say that, that, uh, that I, th I think it's an unfair stereotype, and I think it's unfair to women, quite frankly, to suggest that somehow women are just not really as committed in certain things, and they'll compromise where men won't. I think we, Patrick, and I agree with Patrick and Gwen, with the idea that, that it's not about whether it's a woman candidate, a female candidate. It's about what does this person believe in? What are the principles and policies that they would espouse? And are they able to articulate them firmly and advance them as far as legislative agenda? Well, we never see stubborn women on ruckus, do oh, we? Oh, no, I'm certainly not one and <laughs> very, not outspoken either. Very, very quickly, mm -hmm. Annie, how about Claire McCaskill? She won a third term? Wow, she's got quite a race on her hands. She's about 12 million in the bank compared to four. <laughs> always makes a big difference. So, um, and I she's three points ahead, I think, in the most recent poll. Do you she's, agree? She's very clever. I, yeah, C Carol is an excellent uh, campaigner. I mean, you, you know, she's she's good, and she's hard to beat. Uh, she's, I think she's got a difficult there, There's battle. one woman running for governor in Kansas, Democratic mm -hmm. uh, candidate okay. Laura Kelly. Do you think she has a chance of being the nominee and becoming mm -hmm. governor? She's going to have to work really hard. <laughs> I think she's got a good chance of being the nominee and winning. All right. Really? Yeah. Okay. Oh, wow. We shall Good. press forward. With two attorneys on the panel, there could be no better time to talk about the nation's Supreme Court and who is likely to succeed retiring Justice Anthony Kennedy. President Trump unveiled his selection earlier this week. It is Judge Brett Kavanaugh of the D.C. Circuit Court of Appeals. My judicial philosophy is straightforward. A judge must be independent and must interpret the law, not make the law. A judge must interpret statutes as written, and a judge must interpret the Constitution as written, informed by history and tradition and precedent. All right, Democrats claim a new justice <coughs> with conservative <coughs> credentials will upset the court's balance and produce 5-4 votes that lean conservative. Republicans hope that's true, but add that after all, elections have consequences. A couple of quick nonpartisan facts, I think. There is no constitutional or other legal requirement that the court be balanced ideologically. And there is great respect among lawyers become judges for the concept of stare decisis. Let the decision stand respect legal precedence. It is not, therefore, guaranteed that a new justice will mean Roe v. Wade and other precedent-setting cases will be overturned. So what will be the impact of a more conservative Supreme Court? Let's start with Patrick. Well, I think you're going to see with a Justice Kavanaugh um, 
a, a solid six. Are you conceding that he's going to? I, I think be what, affirmed. What you would, I think it's a hard road to, to to oppose him. I think there's valid grounds to oppose him, but I think that the the, the dynamics and the math are stacked against mm-hmm. the opposition. Um, I, I think that you're going to wind up with a six-three, uh, a hard six-three conservative majority on the court, and that means a lot of things for um, constitutional rights. It means a lot of things for environmental issues. It means things for immigration. It means things for health care. But, but remember this, too. <clears throat> Kavanaugh has been banged around by the left and by the right. Um, he, uh, he stood and took a big bashing in the last couple years for opinions that he, that he wrote on the D.C. Circuit that the right thought were not conservative enough or that missed a chance to attack things that were that were uh, their targets. Obamacare is, is a great example. Um, but, but make no mistake, this will be a 6-3 court. Um, it, will, it will have uh, severe consequences for um, everybody for a generation. And I think, you know, and one of the things that you have to be concerned about, particularly concerned about, is his approach to executive power and his, his approach to what we now know is it would be a hands-off position when it comes to a president who's under investigation or potentially indicted. That is, that is well off, well off the mainstream, and that's a really concerning point of view. Do we have presidents under investigation? <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, there's, 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 there's a witch hunt going on of some kind. I, I, I understand. Do you see six conservative votes? No. Uh, I, I, five, I was, I was uh, wondering right? when yeah, who's the sixth I was, is. I was, he's replacing Kennedy, and Kennedy had basically been the fifth on many, many, and, the, and Kennedy and Kennedy voted. was chosen as a conservative yeah, by but, Ronald Reagan. But, but again, going back to the question that you asked Patrick, and his answer is, is right on point generally, except for the sixth. I'm not sure where that comes from. But the bo- bottom line is, Kennedy. This is not a great change. Kennedy was clearly center right. He voted with the other four conservatives. Okay almost all the time, and he had some departures, but almost all the time. This guy, Kavanaugh, is, is by any definition, center-right. Patrick's exactly right. He's been hit by both the left and the right for various kinds of things. But what it comes down to is the, the real change here, in my view, and this is the problem that I see for the progressives who are so adamantly opposed to him, and I'm not counting Gwen or Patrick because they're, they I speak, haven't said they a speak, word yet. no, no, they speak very articulately. Stand by. I'm not talking about them as some of the loons out there. They, they speak very articulately. There are some out there who oppose him on strictly ideological grounds, and they do it because, and I, I wish I could remember the author's name now, he's a very progressive leftist author who's just written a book and many pieces, and what he said was, the great fear about Kavanaugh is that now as progressives, we're going to have to start making policy by winning elections because they can't count on the court to do it. They had hoped that Hillary would get elected and then they'd put people on the court who would make policy that they haven't been able to make through elections. Kavanaugh is going to be a real problem for them in the sense that he's going to, in my view, not do something radical, he's going to do what judges are supposed to do. He's a textualist. He's going to decide based upon his view of what the text of the Constitution and legislation says, and that's what he Let should do. Let me stop you there. We're almost out of time. Gwen, you're a lot younger than I, but do you recall a time when Supreme Court nominations weren't this much of a controversy? Uh, well, I, I, I recall a time when they were very controversial with uh, Bork, who yeah, was Yeah, but that was 1987. Denied. Before yeah. that, uh, on many occasions, correct me, gentlemen, if I'm wrong, if a lawyer were approved by the ABA, Bar Association as being competent, and uh, the people in the Senate Judiciary Committee well, would approve him, and then the entire Senate But it started with Bork, right. It started right. with Bork. This turn started with Bork. i got to stop there, unfortunately, out of time. Sorry. i got to head to the soapbox for Roast and Toast, where the Ruckats now have 30 seconds each to analyze, compromise, or theorize, and we start with Annie. I am toasting the new governor of the great state of Missouri. He has managed to get around the state, talk to friends and foe alike, and not have any drama. Oh, is that it? That's it. All right, no drama, Patrick. (laughs) I'm going to toast Claire McCaskill because amid all the, the shouting and the yelling, particularly from Josh Hawley, Claire McCaskill every day is talking to Missourians and she's listening to ideas and she's talking about compromise and she is advancing the the, the causes of people uh, in Missouri who care about elected officials and care about public policy. Stephen. I'm roasting Terry McAuliffe and Chuck Schumer for their sky is falling leftist lunacy and claiming that the nomination of Brett Kavanaugh to the Supreme Court is an assault on our democracy and put millions of lives at risk. So how do we know that Kavanaugh is a threat to life as we know it? 
Well, first, he's a Catholic, so he hates Jews and Muslims. Uh, he has two kids, so clearly he hates abortion and gays. He drives a car, so he hates the environment. He hires female law clerks, so he clearly hates women. And the unpardonable sin, he's a conservative white man, so he's clearly a racist. So I'm wearing my hard hat until the sky stops falling. Oh, my God. Very handsome and very understated, Steve. Uh, Gwen. Yeah, I'm roasting Joe Hudson, the political director of the Carpenters Union and local organized labor who are holding hostage the agreement on the new airport by insisting on 100 percent union jobs to the detriment of minority participation on the project. Organized labor has a solid track record of implementing exclusionary policies and practices that make it difficult and most often impossible for African Americans and Latinos to obtain union credentials. Insisting on 100% jobs will ensure that, yet again, minorities will be blocked out, left behind, and denied equitable access to economic opportunity on a $1.5 billion project. This is unconscionable, and they should be held accountable. And finally, by now, most of us know the name Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. She is the 28-year-old self-proclaimed Democratic Socialist who won a Democratic primary in New York, endorsing Medicare for All and elimination of ICE. But do you know her nickname? According to GOP operative Brad Blakeman, it's Bernice Sanders. <laughs> and that's Ruckus for this week. We're back next Thursday at 7. Now for the Ruckets and the crew, Mike Shannon saying thanks very much for watching and good night.